right, so good morning and welcome to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy that you've all joined us today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or MCSA's Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA's Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the general public, and to develop responses to meet some of those needs, to enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging, and finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Today, our guest, Dr. Danilo Bozdok, studied medicine between 2006 and 2012 at RWTH Aachen University, Université de Lausanne, and Harvard Medical School, supported by the German National Merit Foundation. In 2013 to 2015, Dr. Bozdok pursued a PhD in computer science on machine learning. He was named Rising Star by the Association for Psychological Science, APS, in 2017, and selected as a Rising Star Scientist by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2018. Since 2019, he has served as Associate Professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at McGill's Faculty of Me Medicine and as Canadian CCARE AI Chair at MULA, Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute, Montreal, Canada, including cross appointments at the McConnell Brain Image Centre, Montreal Neurological Institute, Ludmir Centre for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health, and the School of Computer Science at McGill University. Before continuing, we would just like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom, and then if you have any questions, please wait until the end of the conference to ask them. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Bozdok to start his presentation, Perceived Social Isolation and Its Impact on the Human Social Brain. All right, I hope everybody can hear me. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. So um, the mandate of my research activity and my team is to bridge the ongoing neuroscience activities at McGill's Faculty of Medicine on the one hand and state-of-the-art quantitative analytics, um, especially in large data sets as practice in Emila Quebec AI Institute and to really bridge this quantitative and this biomedical activity. So today I will present a series of studies that are mostly very recent and not yet published um, that revolve around social isolation and its impact on the human brain. This closure currently uh, receive support from, from Google. Um, <clears throat> so if you think about why is the human brain the way it is, then one of the favorite interpretations is the so-called social brain hypothesis. The social brain hypothesis holds that it is maybe not the uh, the, the, the aspects of the constant physical environment that have most shaped um, the primate brain towards the powerful and metabolically expensive organ that it is today. So maybe tasks like finding food sources, remembering aspects of the physical environment were not by themselves the most crucial drivers of the selection pressures that really dro drove to always more sophisticated human brains and neurocognitive operations. Um, the social brain hypothesis holds that um, what is distinctly different, differently evolved in primates and in particular in humans is the complexity of social interaction. So how humans interact with each other as, as a species may be more advanced than in potentially any other species. So for example, at some point in primate evolution, we started to uniquely recognize other individuals based on their faces. And this was really the basis to acquire subject specific knowledge, such that over multiple encounters, we were able to integrate across different instances of behaviors and events to deduce aspects of personality that are time enduring about a particular agent. Um, it is also the basis for actually remembering what somebody has done in the past 
to anticipate what somebody is likely to do in the future. So, and these types of critical steps probably led up to, for example, a very well-developed capacity of perspective taking or theory of mind or mentalizing, so sort of, uh, similar words. So the capacity to put oneself to somebody else's shoes. Theory of mind in turn is probably a prerequisite for so many other activities that are human defining. And one of my favorite examples is giving a lecture or giving a talk like now. So to really deliver knowledge from one human to another, this attempt just requires the speaker to put oneself into the other shoes to think about what is their vocabulary, value system, knowledge base, expectations, and only then kind of the didactic mission of transmitting knowledge from one person to another can, can really be fully successful. So this may be a, a most um, critically manifested in academic institutions, such as universities. And this is how we transmit from one generation to the next, also propelled by, by language and so on and so forth. So the most critical difference between the human species in general and potentially any other species on the planet may be tracking, inferring, remembering, and anticipating complex events of the social environment. So if this is the case, and there are many parts of the brain that are very metabolically expensive, they're constantly active, they're very closely related to some of the most advanced social effective processing capacities. If this is the case, a natural question is of course, what happens in the absence or in um, moments of scarcity when humans are not stimulated socially by the environment to the same extent as they are in their normal lives? So one way to think about the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 crisis is that it, it very much imposes a globe white experiment in social distancing. So from a psychological perspective, um, it is very interesting to consider and study, are there any systematic consequences, ramifications of thousands and thousands of human beings across the planet experiencing disruption from meeting acquaintances, going to restaurants, having a clear separation between work life and um, private life. Um, and, and it's probably the case that, at least in recent history, there has never been such a, um, such a social isolation impact or such a kind of extended, spatially distributed across the planet synchronized event of social isolation in general. So a lot of knowledge has been acquired about how social disconnection related to human health and behavior in general. Uh, for example, um, there's a number of um, consequences for um, mental health um, which is probably interesting to several uh, in, in this audience. Those are things like, we know that there's an increased suicide rate when people experience um, bouts of social disconnection or isolation. We know that um, substance use and abuse is rising in these, um, in these periods. We know that um, various other mental health conditions are actually um, exacerbated. Um, one that is most closely connected to aging is probably Alzheimer's. So over the last five to 10 years, there have been a series of high profile publications that showed that people who are chronically socially disconnected do experience onset of dementia and Alzheimer's disease earlier on average.
So um, we're very far away from really fully understanding um, the mechanisms that lead to this observation. But it has been confirmed repeatedly that um, there is a connection between the amount of daily social stimulation that uh, humans uh, receive and um, the general capacity to um, yeah, oneself feel into other people, introspect into other people's minds, but it also leads to major mental health conditions. So just as an aside, it's not only impact on mental health and, and psychology um, that is at play here. And there's actually a series of consequences for the human body, which was summarized in our recent paper, uh, The Neurobiology of Social Distance, Transcognitive Neurosciences this year. And some of these, some of these more general consequences of a perceived lack of social isolation for the body and health in general, independent of the brain potentially, is, um, for example, things like wound healing. So um, people who have, who are recovering from surgery, for example, they need more time to really recover physically from this intervention if they are less well socially surrounded. The, more broadly, the immune system is actually impaired in individuals who are socially isolated. <clears throat> so there's really a, a large array of very general diseases that are increased, including cardiovascular disease and so on, that are not maybe immediately mechanistically related to social interaction. So, but what uh, our recent research is really trying to tackle is what is the relationship of social disconnection with the human brain. So here you see results uh, that are currently under, under revision. Um, we are hoping to have an answer any day. And what you see here um, is data that resulted from, from a Bayesian hierarchical analysis of 40,000 subjects from the UK Biobank population imaging cohort. So for those who haven't heard about the UK Biobank yet, that is the currently largest existing biomedical data set. And since the beginning of this year, it also has structural, functional, and fiber track anatomical brain measurements from uh, 40,000 participants. This is the data that we um, capitalized on to ask um, which parts of the brain are reliably associated with people who indicate that they feel lonely. So it's important here to emphasize that loneliness, as defined here in this particular study, is really um, a subjective window into social interaction. So there's really probably no other way of knowing whether somebody feels, perceives oneself lonely than to ask a person. Okay, so this is the opposite of objective, of the objective quality or quantity of social interaction. Okay, so this is how it's defined in the psychological literature uh, for some time now. So what you can see here is, we have two different types of results. Um, what you see on um, the borders, uh, the right border uh, on the bottom, those are uh, Bayesian posterior parameter distributions that say, in this structural data, um, which major brain network is actually most likely regional brain volume differences in lonely people better on a network level rather than by isolated single brain regions? So <clears throat> there were 100 brain regions that we considered in this analysis. So the whole brain was divided in 100 uh, candidate atlas compartments. But we ran analysis that at the same time appreciated population variation both at the network level and at the single region level. And what you see on the borders from B to H panels is that it's really the default mode network, all the regions that belong to this network who could have positive effects or negative effects with more or less loneliness, but it is first and foremost regions that belong to the default mode network 
that really explain the main differences between who indicates reports him or herself is lonely or does not. So more specifically, um, you see um, the posterior superior temporal sarcus or TPJ here in the top half. Um, those are regions that have been classically associated with things like perspective taking, um, reading intentions from other people's faces or eye gaze. Um, <clears throat> so there, those are regions that are related to higher social effective capacities. Um, you also see that some of them have positive effects, whereas some of those have negative effects. So it's not the case that the anti-default network would just be increased in volume or decreased in volume uniformly. There's a spatially distributed pattern of increases and decreases in volume in individuals that indicate to feel lonely. Oh, actually what I should have said is the subjects, these 40,000 people, their age is between um, 40 and 69. So there's a 30, a 30 year age window. So it pretty much covers midlife. And this is the results that we really see here. Um, another important aspect here is if you look at the top left image, um, there we see the inferior parietal lobe, but also what is uh, um, labeled as CO, that's the operculum. That is really the, the most common finding in the brain imaging community on loneliness. So there's just a handful of existing studies that consider brain imaging and loneliness, typically in a few dozen subjects. Um, and the most common finding is the regions that I just mentioned, which are sometimes called the ventral attention network in the right hemisphere. And it's been classically associated with differences in alertness, skewed perception of other individuals. Um, so lonely people do think that others are kind of against them. Um, they anticipate to get rejected and they have negatively biased um, perception of social cues from others. So in these regions were typically associated um, with loneliness and discussed in the context of these systematic deviations in lonely individuals, which we already knew before from psychological research. So this is how um, this study is different from this previous research because we show in a systematic analysis that 40,000 people from midlife, um, the largest biomedical data set, that it is really the default mode network that drives structural brain volume differences in the first brain imaging modality that we analyzed here. So how did we, how did we do this? Just very quick. Um, so the way this works is we have a statistical model where the outcome variable Y is really literally only yes or no, somebody feels lonely. And just with a single indicator variable, so this is a, a, a big Bayesian hierarchical uh, multivariate logistic regression model. Just with this indicator, we fit at the same time the implication of 100 brain atlas regions, as well as their anchoring in spatially distributed large scale networks. That's the parts that you see in the middle, which we take from the, from the uh, um, Schaefer EO atlas. So that's uh, based on existing knowledge. So, and what this model does is it calibrates the contribution of regions versus brain networks as a function of uh, perceived social isolation. So that means that the model tells you automatically, should we attend to specific brain region effects or is the more pertinent uh, interpretation the general network level? So the most dominant effect, as you saw on the previous slide, was the default on the work. If we again look at these 40,000 individuals, now on brain functions. So this is um, functional coupling relationships of, again, 100 brain regions across the cortical sheath. And this is just the most common functional coupling Pearson correlation measurement um, in, the in the intrinsically active resting state brain. So, this complements the structural brain findings that I showed in the previous slide. And what you see here in a different window into the brain, again with the same population, same measure of social isolation, you see that there is in this um, partially squares analysis, there's a systematic um, increase in function coupling shifts 
especially in regions inside of the default wound network on the top left, but also limbic emotional systems as well as frontal parietal control systems. That's the first dominant effect that we found here in functional connectivity analysis in the lonely conic tome, if you will. And the second interesting aspect uh, in our view is here what you see on the borders in blue. So there's a systematic disconnection of the visual cortex with various other brain systems of the rest of the brain, in particular, um, the higher level ones. So we know that these higher level systems that already came up here in the brain structure, as well as these most lower system, visual sensory processing, they're really at different extremes of the neural processing hierarchy. So one possible interpretation of what we see here is that there may be a functional decoupling of the early sensory cortices from the higher um, associative, higher socio-effective default mode related types of circuits. And uh, an interpretation um, that we propose here in this work is that uh, lonely people are known to be more internally focused. Um, for example, a common interpretation is this lonely individuals, um, they essentially make up social interaction to fill the social void. So that can have various forms of flavors. For example, um, lonely people tend to reminisce more about social interactions in the past, possible social events in the future, and all of these, or they uh, anthropomorphize more with their pets. So they um, treat pets um, more as, hu as humans, as if they were a human agent than uh, the average population. So, and this may be one interpretation that is consistent with this observation and brain uh, function, and that is that those circuits that are very far away from the early sensory processing from input of the external environment, they're kind of decoupled, whereas the brain systems that are in the higher association cortex, furthest away from sensory inputs, uh, uh, thought to be related to self relevant processing, these circuits are uh, upregulated in their functional coupling. This is actually confirmed by the third modality uh, in, in this uh, population imaging cohort, which is diffusion imaging. So um, we measure the integrity of major fiber tracts that connect in white matter, different gray matter uh, uh, regions across the brain. So we, uh, we um, considered 48 different major white matter tracts that you see here on the, on, on the bottom. And what's interesting is that there's a three fiber tracks that are most consistently related to perceived social isolation in these 40,000 people. And those are the ones that you see in red on the top. They're all fornix related fibers. Why do we find it particularly interesting that the top three among the 48 candidate white runner atlas fiber tracks um, are all related to the fornix? That's because the fornix was shown in our previous research to be the main input source for the default mode network, which we just showed in brain structure and brain function. So um, this output tract of the hippocampus probably carries space and time information from the hippocampus medial uh, limbic system towards the higher association cortex in general and the default mode network in particular, which was which kind of becoming more and more clear. But here we show that these fiber tracts, which are thought to relate to episodic memory, for example, they are systematically kind of stronger, more developed in uh, lonely individuals. And this fits again with our hypothesis that <clears throat> the lonely individual may be kind of more in the habit of imagining social events that lack in the actual everyday experience. So here's the complement to the loneliness results that I showed on the previous slide. So this is a different study in the same data set. Again, UK Biobank Population Imaging Court. This time we look at social support. So what measure of social support? Here, the subjects were asked, um, how often do you meet close others, which could be family or friends, who um, you can share your private thoughts and experience with. So this is, this is every, almost every day, 
once per week, and so on and so forth. So here we distinguish this objective measure of social isolation, so of the quantity of social exchange, which less depends on the subjective uh, impression of whether somebody feels lonely or not. So it's the exact opposite of the previous study. So social support now uh, shows a different brain association. Um, and that is what you see here in purple and yellow, the ventral attention system or the, the salient system and the limbic system. So um, it's interesting to see that now we really, um, we really highlight systems of the brain that are much closer to early sensory processing and what some people would think action, are action perception cycles. And these types of systems are more closely associated with kind of empathizing, meeting, encountering, and managing social relationships on a regular basis to confide with others. Um, and this is really kind of complementary to the higher association, um, far away from sensory circuits findings that I showed on the previous slides. So it's again a Bayesian hierarchical analysis. This is the network level part of the brain structure uh, in the exact same atlas. If we now look on at the region findings of this study, we see again that it's really um, the SANS network with the anterior cingulate cortex, mid cingulate cortex that you can see here that are among the top 10 most associated brain regions, but also the anterior insula in particular on the left. Um, again, similar to the previous study, we find some positive associations uh, in red, but also negative volume associations with social support in blue in these systems. Um, and this part, this set of regions, mid cortex, anterior insula, this is really kind of the, the core hubs of what people mean when they talk about the salient system. Um, it has been discussed a lot in the mirror neuron literature. So um, the idea that people are able to empathize, emotionally tune into other people because they essentially replay um, motor, emotionally mm, colored motor movements of others in their, in their own brain machinery. Um, and this vicarious replay may allow humans to better understand the emotional experiences others go through. So um, that is, of course, only one possible inter uh, interpretation, but um, it's certainly a very common one. And um, this particular set of regions, which came out strongest in our network level analysis, this set of brain regions has really been confirmed again and again in meta-analyses, quantitative meta-analyses of hundreds, and hundreds of studies, brain imaging studies, that those are the most common hubs of neural activity change in the context of empathic experience. But we also have a bunch of other regions. So the left and right uh, TPJ, temporal parietal junction, which you see on the top. Um, of course, a lot of functional associations are discussed in literature. A favorite association that we like to discuss um, um, is that these regions have been proposed to be kind of functional coupling devices that are implicated in shifting between kind of internal cognition and externally oriented real world um, cognition as we think would be necessary in um, engaging with others, reading their faces, reading their mimics and gestures to really um, emotionally tune into uh, the people we encounter. And then we also have the orbital frontal cortex here in blue, so parts of the limbic system. <clears throat> so um, that of course makes sense because they're closely associated with emotion processing, reward contingent processing. So many of these effects um, are probably sex specific. So in general, um, it seems like it's still an open question to a large extent whether the male and human social brain are different. Um, I looked at the literature last year and it seemed to me that as many neuroscientists claim that there are definitely no differences in the social brain in humans or the human brain in general as the neuroscientists who claim the opposite. Um, in this context, 
uh, of social brain and sex differences. For example, there are more females are, uh, are reported to be lonely than males, okay? If we just look at the behavioral data, there are a lot of indicators that social support, loneliness, how, the ways people organize the social networks, they are to a large extent social, they're, they're sex specific. So females on average, for example, have better support networks on average um, in mid and later life, which is why they tend to have better social buffers um, in, in times of crisis, such as the one we are uh, going through right now. And, and this is why it makes sense to really look closely um, and zoom in on what are sex differences in the human social brain. So we did this in UK Biobank Population Court. That's work that got published uh, uh, this year with my PhD student, uh, Hannah Kieso. And here you just see one example uh, of the various uh, indicators of wide ranging, distributed and strong sex differences in the human social brain. So here we look at household size. So a very demographic measure, which typically not investigated in experimental uh, fMRI studies. So it's literally the number, how many people live where you live. With this simple number, um, we can show that, for example, if you look on the left, the human amygdala has a very different um, volume uh, variation. In women with more people at home versus women who are not so well socially stimulated at home. So that's the, the dark rose and the light rose colors. But we don't see such a difference between kind of more socially surrounded, less socially surrounded at home women. We don't see the same in males. However, if you look at a different part of the limbic system, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, so that's the one that we just showed here in the relation to social support. If you look at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, however, there we see a bigger volume deviation in males with even opposite effects, whether or not um, they have nobody at home or several people, which is less strong in females. So we can find a number of these differences um, in the human social brain in males and females. Another one is aspects of socioeconomic status. So <clears throat> the nucleus accumbens, the reward circuitry, for example, shows uh, much stronger differences in low income males, which you see on the left, um, which we cannot find in high income uh, versus low income females. So long story short, we looked at more than a dozen different indicators of social complexity in the environment. And in all of them, we found some degree of sex differences in the brain. Um, they were not overlapping, so they're distributed across the human social brain um, from lower sensory systems to intermediate uh, processes systems, to mirror neuron types of brain systems, all the way to higher association or default mode systems. So the entire social brain shows expressions of population volume deviation that are um, divergent between males and females. Um, we also looked at this from yet another angle, and this is just um, groups of indicators of social life and social experience. So here you see domains of indicators of social lifestyle indicators and which ones are most specifically associated with, with males on the top or females on the bottom in the human social brain. And you say that in these um, structural brain imaging data from the UK Biobank population court that on the top um, in males, there's a lot more personality and demographic associations in the limbic system and in the higher association system. Um, or more specifically, if you look at the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens in the hippocampus, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, um, dominant regions that we see in the limbic system, there's a, a lot more associations related to general demographic factors, whereas in females, you have a lot more purple so the personality aspects appear to be much more dominant in females. If you really try to put your finger on which domains of differences exist in the, in the male versus female social brains. So here, just very quick, um, 
there's also systematic age effects. So if you look at um, the marginal posterior uh, distributions, uh, how they kind of interact to kind of in these associations of the ventral prefrontal cortex on the left or the frontal pole on the right, um, we see that the relationship to age and whether or not somebody has like a certain personality feature or a certain um, experience of certain aspects in, in the social environment, there's a lot of age uh, aspects that are different in male and female, in males and females at two. Okay, and so the, the last study I, I just briefly want to mention is uh, on socioeconomic status. So socioeconomic status, again, is very closely related to um, health. We know that uh, individuals who are an underrepresented part of underrepresented communities um, or low socioeconomic status groups, there is uh, a more difficult access to health services and um, there's a, a kind of a, a more common um, visits in hospitals. So on a number of measures, um, low socioeconomic status individuals experience more distress and um, kind of difficulty in multiple health dimensions. And this has been again confirmed in the current COVID crisis. So um, there have been um, more. It has been more struggle and distress and need in low socioeconomic uh, uh, um, status communities than in kind of the the, the typical white middle upper class uh, um, kind of at home worker. So this kind of um, reinvigorates the need to really understand how is the socioeconomic status related to the human brain. Um, in general. So what we see here on this, pre on this first slide is just six different measures of socioeconomic status. We have income, how much money does somebody earn um, in general. We have how many years did they go to school, um, the type of degree, whether they live in a, a neighborhood that is deprived, where a, that is, for example, overcrowded, or there's um, maybe more violence, for example, in, the, uh, uh, in this particular neighborhood where people live, the number of vehicles that the family owns or the individual owns, and whether or not they have um, an, an, a job that is typical for a knowledge worker versus a, a manual professional type of job. So in this principal component analysis, just very short, you see that um, the driving factor is really neighborhood status. So the first principal component that explains most variation just on the behavioral level, there's no brain data yet. Um, the neighborhood, uh, the quality of the neighborhood is the driving factor across these six socioeconomic status variables. The second most dominant factor comes from vehicles and income. They uh, carry very similar information about the socioeconomic position of an individual in society and third is education and similar things. But let's look at what this looks like in the brain. Um, on the left, you see gray matter regions and uh, the most significant ones um, with positive ne and negative effects in red and blue, respectively. And on the right, you see, um, again, the 48 major white matter tracts um, with their statistically significant associations with high versus low socioeconomic status um, with the same color coding in red and blue. So the way we ran this analysis is uh, unusual for the brain imaging community again, because we conducted a, a multitask rich regression, multi-outcome, multivariate, multitask, uh, a machine learning approach, where we ran a single model on all the six socioeconomic status dimensions in the 10,000 people at the same time. So the things you see on the left that is the result of one single model estimation. And all the results in white matter that you see on the right are the results of, an, of another model estimation. So there seem to be a lot of distributed effects. Um, but what may not be obvious so much when we look at the statistically significant regions only 
is are there maybe systematic spatial patterns of, of, of brain structural deviations as a function of socioeconomic status? So we ran a post hoc analysis and based on the brain socioeconomic status associations that you see on the left. So on the left, you see before statistical significance testing, you see all the parts of the gray pair um, that have been associated with higher or lower socioeconomic status um, in any of these brain regions that we considered. And what becomes more apparent here is that the right side, if you look at the leftmost column, there really seem to be predominantly green and blue colors. So less volume with higher socioeconomic status, whereas um, in the left brains, across these six socioeconomic status measures, we really see uh, mostly yellow and red colors. So a positive association with socioeconomic status. So there seems to be just eyeballing the um, unthresholded um, model coefficients, just, just looking at those, it seems like there may be a left-right difference in how brain structure and brain architectural features are associated with dimensions of socioeconomic uh, position. So we more explicitly tested this with the, with the analysis that you see here on the right. Um, <clears throat> what we did is we essentially ran a simple uh, correlation on top of the model coefficients that you see on the left. So for any pair of homologous brain regions, left and right anterior insula, left and right amygdala, left and right temporal pole, we just correlated, is there um, a pattern in how homologous symmetrical brain regions in the left and right brain have been found to be associated with a given socioeconomic status measure. And then you see, for example, for income on the top, uh, that if you consider all brain regions dark red, there is a negative correlation in how the left brain regions and the right brain regions are systematically associated with difference in socioeconomic status. That's also the case if we only look at cortical regions. So there's one exception here in income and subcortical regions, there's a small positive effect. But if you also look only at the white beta fiber tracks, let's see the, the results on the right, um, the unthresholded coefficients again, we see a negative dominant uh, um, kind of hemispheric asymmetry in the associations between brain and socioeconomic status. So, and um, what was striking to us is that in all these uh, six different measures, different ways to measure socioeconomic status, which we showed here are not the same, but they're also not entirely different. So they tell complementary yet distinct stories about socioeconomic status, but all of the six show a dominant left-right deviation. So why may that be? Um, just very briefly, um, there has been reports on left-right differences in socioeconomic status in brain imaging studies before, so similar to loneliness, there's maybe a handful of studies, I would say five, 10, maybe 15 brain imaging studies um, in humans. And um, most of them very much focused on the frontal pole. So there are some hints in the existing literature that suggested there may be a right left imbalance um, as a function of socioeconomic status in general. Um, but it has certainly not been shown for the entire human brain, also not in the population cohort, and also not to be a global feature of the white matter uh, too. So now some people would probably think, okay, why is that? What's the reason why we observe this? So one common association uh, in this previous literature is that maybe the left brain, which is language dominant, and most people, um, Maybe that is a language effect, but um, it has been shown that if you account for richness of vocabulary and other language capacities, then there's still a bigger brain region volume in the left brain and higher socioeconomic status individuals. And similarly, um, differences in volume, mostly in the right hemisphere, 
you remember we talked about the stress alertness in the right hemisphere on the earliest slides in lonely individuals. Um, kind of the right hemisphere in socioeconomic status has commonly been discussed in the context of uh, immunosuppression, chronic stress, um, what else? And differences in kind of attention span and kind of managing, managing attention in general. But again, also here, that's probably not the whole story because if you account for stress levels such as by cortisol in the blood and so on and so forth, there's still left, left right brain differences. So to summarize this last study, we looked at 10,000 people, six different, uh, six different socioeconomic status measures. Uh, we looked at white matter and gray matter. And we find that across these measures, across these windows into the brain, there's a dominant left-right differences in how structural variation in a distributed fashion is associated with uh, the left and right brain. Okay, so to summarize, I hope it became clear that um, loneliness and social isolation are two sides of coin. Loneliness has been discussed in the psychological literature before as capturing mostly the subjective perceived social isolation, and there's probably no other way than asking a certain individual, do you feel lonely? Whereas social isolation, which, so objective social isolation, is a, a more easily quantifiable differences, difference um, in the social capital and social richness that somebody encounters. And we showed uh, in the first two studies that there are also distinctly different in their brain manifestations. So perceived socialization maybe relates to inward focus types of cognition, uh, rumination, um, reveries, kind of filling the social void with dreams of social interactions. Whereas the circuits that we discovered in objective social isolation in the second study, that was much more related to salient systems, more closely related to early sensory systems, <clears throat> and potentially mirror neuron circuitries. So the second point, uh, loneliness is not yet another emotional state. It is quite complicated. If you look in the loneliness literature, um, it is a little bit a state. It's also a trait. It impacts emotion. There are bouts of loneliness that come and go. So it's a very complicated phenomenon. I mentioned some of the systematic uh, perceptual skewing that has also been noted and reported in loneliness. So it's, it's not an easy phenomenon. It's certainly more complicated than happiness or disgust processing, for example, which are two standard Ekman basic emotions. Um, the default one that was really center stage in the loneliness uh, findings uh, in perceived social isolation. This is emphasized here because loneliness is perhaps the dominant aspect if people ask, What's the impact of mass social isolation as we experience now during the COVID-19 pandemic on brain circuitry? And so the last aspect is compounding factors, causal directions require more research. So the thing is that all the results that are showed, the cross-sectional data, we cannot disentangle the nature and nurture relationships, whether somebody was already lonely or predisposed to be depressed. And this is why people lonely or people become lonely and then they get depressed. We cannot say anything about that. We would need a long, longitudinal data to get at these types of questions. So with this, I would like to thank my collaborators on the left, as well as the institutions on the right for the financial support. And I thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. So I'm a little bit over 50 minutes. That's okay. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself or turn on your camera and you can ask them to Dr. Bozdoc. Don't be shy. Hi, Danilo. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. It was always, you know, uh, very impressed. Impress uh, causes a lot of impact. Your way to reason about the interactions between uh, the biology of the brain, uh, the brain, the way the brain works, and also 
uh, these interactions with uh, uh, social uh, events. So the question here is that we have a, a significant amount of our audience are in, have in the family patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions like frontotemporal dementia. And uh, the first question that perhaps would be important for us is how can we connect this uh, with uh, dementing disease? So loneliness or social interaction, they at mm -hmm. certain extent represent uh, real risk factors. Is this modifiable in your opinion? Um, so for the first aspect, I think we did not directly investigate dementia or Alzheimer's disease, but um, the favorite slide uh, for my subjective perception is certainly this one here. So um, I think this has been an important step towards connecting social isolation to Alzheimer's for the following reason. Um, as I emphasized, um, well-known psychologists, they very much emphasize the ventral attention system as most important in lonely individuals and in the lonely brain. And that is really the dominant stream in the, in the handful of brain imaging studies on loneliness from my personal perspective. We show here that if we look at the brain from the perspective of gray matter variation, intrinsic functional coupling, and integrity of white matter fiber tracts um, in well-defined atlases, in all these three different windows into the brain, we identify the default mode network as the most important source of deviation in lonely individuals in 40,000 individuals, which is 50 times bigger than any other loneliness study that was uh, conducted uh, before. So there are three different windows into the brain that all point to the highest association systems, the default mode network. Why is this important? Because that's the exact end pathway of Alzheimer's disease, as you know better than me. So there's uh, many papers, for example, Randy Buckner's classic paper on how Alzheimer's uh, may perhaps be some form of overuse of default mode network circuits. And this is how there seems to be a common uh, pathway in how chronic perceived social isolation is manifested in the brain and the brain imprint, the brain manifestations that we typically discuss in the dementia literature, uh, or Alzheimer's in particular. And um, whether or not this is modifiable, I would argue that um, not everything about Alzheimer's is modifiable, of course. I think 30 or 35 percent of um, the liability in Alzheimer's is kind of potentially modifiable. Things like exercise, sleep, diabetes, anything related to cardiovascular disease. So there's a number of pathways that do influence Alzheimer's. And what this kind of, what our research kind of invigorates is we should really look into social factors because that is something that is better modifiable than changing an individual's APOE4 status. I see. So uh, another question that uh, it's important also is about the social context, right? So uh, you were born in, in, in Europe, in Germany, right? You live in Paris mm -hmm. and now you're in Montreal. Do you, and you experience three different, you know, uh, cultures. So do you think that a cultural environment can somehow amplify uh, 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 the tendency of isolate or social exposure? And uh, do you think that this has also an implication in, in brain networks? Or do you think, uh, how, how much do you think this process is, is, is nature or this is nurtured by the environment? So now you are exactly, exactly what, 
you're forcing me to, to talk about what I explicitly excluded in my last note. Um, so our data, the disclaimer is our data cannot say something about that. I can only um, speculate based on the data that other people have acquired before uh, in humans, but especially rats and monkeys. Um, and I would think that um, personality context, it, it, it probably plays a strong role. Um, it's easy to think that um, people who are maybe a little bit uncomfortable being engaged in social interaction at work may be maybe better off working from home with other individuals who are maybe more extroverted, very talkative, social hyperactive. It is easy to think that um, people with such a behavioral repertoire are maybe more vulnerable and less resilient to the sudden shortage of everyday social interaction as we experience now. So I think that probably there's an impact but to really study this carefully, um, I'm not aware of a data set that could do this. Um, may I ask a question, please? Yes. How do you suggest that we mitigate this effect of, on the brain of loneliness? Is there any, uh, anything which we could do, any, as you mentioned, exercise or nutrition or whatever, but how does we counter effect mm -hmm. this effect? How do we counteract that effect? Is, is it um, yeah, good, good question. Um, we we tried to summarize some of these in our recent piece uh, in ticks uh, that is mentioned here on the bottom. So my co-author Rob Dunbar, he's he's really the world authority in social networks from an anthropological perspective, and that he really wrote that part. It's box four or five in that paper. And from his perspective, the things that make us intrinsically happy um, in our social interaction, which we could still do in some shape, form, capacity, even in our current environment, include things like eating together, um, playing music together, um, Social touch is very important, for example. So what uh, takes the form of grooming and monkeys um, is maybe manifested in human behavior in, in the form of just touching other skin. So several of these activities, they do lead to um, endorphin uh, release in the body. They're intrinsically rewarding. And they, they're important to kind of fuel our emotion and mood. So we made a number of suggestions in this direction. Mm -hmm. But can that be reversed? The effects which you showed on the, on, this, on the graphs, can they be reversed by social interactions? Um, I would say um, that's also what the newspapers asked. So when we published this paper, there were different, like, I gave like 20 different interviews over the last uh, few months. Uh, there was just an article in the Globe and Mail just this week on this piece. And that's the question that the reporters asked most commonly. Uh, is it bad? So I think I emphasized that, yes, it can be bad. And then the second most common question was probably, can we reverse it? And I typically said two things. The one is um, the scale of social isolation that we experienced recently or, or are still experiencing, and that is probably unprecedented. So there cannot be a systematic study that has systematically investigated the, the impact and also not whether it's reversible or not. So I would say, an honest answer, first of all, is that the question cannot be answered at this point, I think. If we talk about the scale of social isolation of the current extent, okay, 
Um, so another aspect is it very much depends on which segment, which stratum of the human population we are talking about. So social isolation, which we very much try to emphasize in this piece, it has strong impact on all different ages. And if we talk about humans, um, it has maybe been best studied or most convincingly studied from my subjective perspective in, in children. So orphans have been studied in randomized clinical trials um, that investigated the differences between orphans who got adopted by foster families, and especially in Romania and Russia. Those are some of the seminal studies around the 2000s science papers. And they showed again and again the earlier a child gets adopted into a common socio-effective context of a regular family with a loving home and so on and so forth, the better the developmental trajectory for the rest of the life, okay? So the children that get adopted earlier as orphans into a regular family, um, they have better attention, better language capacities, have a higher IQ, better working memory, and so on and so forth. These studies also showed that many of these effects are reversible. So from my perspective, the way I read the literature, I think the orphan clinical trials from Romania and Russia, it may seem maybe a little bit far-fetched, but that seems to be the hardest evidence that even in neurodevelopment in early life, social deprivation, can be reversed in its consequences if people kind of socially rehabilitate in, in a common, regular social environment. I hope that's somewhat satisfying as an answer. Yeah, I just, I, I, just a follow up question. I hope I'm not overstating. Has anything been done or researched with uh, prisoners in social, social but solitary isolation for years and years? Okay. Yeah, I can't say anything about that. I just don't know this literature. I watched the movie, the experiment, but that's it. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, are there any other questions for Dr. Bozdok? Give it a minute. Maybe last one. Well, thank you so much for doing this fantastic presentation today. The NCSA Education Committee would like to thank you and everybody who signed up today. Um, our next event is, again, from our Bernie Boomer Lecture Series. It's going to be uh, with Juliana Guerrero on this Thursday. Um, and then our next uh, Bernie Boomer again will be next week on Tuesday. And then we have a Health Month event. We've put the link to our event break page down in the chat box. You can check out all of our events. We've also put the link for our um, just a brief survey because we'd love to hear your feedback about today's event or any other event that you've attended. And uh, we've also put our link for our YouTube channel in case you've missed an event and you'd like to see it at a later date. It's, it'll be up there. Uh, so just one more time. Thank you, everybody, for signing in today. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.